welcome to the Center for Applied Theology and tonight's Foundation Year program. The session uh, is on Rousseau and Voltaire, and we will be led in this by Dr. Augustine Cassidy, erstwhile theologian, now lawyer based in Glasgow, Scotland. Welcome, Augustine, and I will hand it over to Lucy to uh, lead us in our questions. Thank you, Father James. And Augustine, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to have you here. Um, so, as you probably know, we've been on a, a bit of a, a roller coaster ride. We, we started um, last term with the classics, we've moved through, we, we did the Divine Comedy, and um, we've done the Scientific re uh, re Revolution. We're now in the Enlightenment, and we're turning to these two delightful figures, uh, which are Voltaire and Jean Jacques Rousseau. Um, so could you please start by telling us a little bit about the context which brought these two writers to prominence? Yes, of course. Um, well, let me just start with a couple of dates. Um, Voltaire was born in Paris in 1694, and it was also in Paris that he died in 1778. Um, Rousseau was born a bit later, 1712, he was born in Geneva, and um, there's probably going to be occasion to say quite a bit about that. Um, and Rousseau also died in 1778, which is very convenient. So um, basically, their lives run roughly for the first three quarters of the 18th century. What they both um, have in common is they were both um, itinerant, really, in the sense that um, they were constantly being run off from one place to the next. And both of them, as it happens, spent um, not a terribly long time, not at the same time, but a very formative period of time in England. Um, Voltaire discovered Shakespeare when he was in England and was very impressed by his um, plays. Um, Rousseau was deeply influenced by Thomas Hobbes. They were both quite conversant with trends in um, English literature, English philosophy, and English politics. And in fact, uh, one of the other commonalities between the two of them is that they were both literary figures really as much as they were um, philosophers in the kind of sense that is probably familiar to us in the um, Anglo-American analytic tradition of philosophy. So for example, both Voltaire and Rousseau advanced some of their most seminal thoughts um, in the form of novels. With Voltaire, um, think immediately of Candide, uh, about which I'll have a little more to say in a moment. And uh, Rousseau um, wrote Emile, or On Education. Uh, they, they both would also write rather more straightforwardly philosophical texts, but for both of them, my sense certainly is that the literary activity, the essays, the poetry was very much in service of the overall program that they pursued. And I would characterize that chiefly as a reaction against the um, absolutist French monarchy against the established um, Catholic Church in France, and they both advocated for what we would broadly recognize today as a, a liberal philosophy. Um, not simply a philosophy of liberal politics, although I mean that as well, but also, and, and perhaps especially, an approach to philosophy 
that emphasized um, freedom of thought. Now, um, this is set in a wider context of the, the sort of early phases of the Enlightenment movement, where a lot of conventions are being challenged and questioned and overturned. So although um, they are both significant figures in terms of um, the religious debates of the day, they are not especially um, orthodox in, in their religion, if I would put it that way. Um, Voltaire, it comes across very much as a, a deist. He is no fan at all of the established church, of uh, the prominence of clergy, and he's he's actually wickedly funny. Um, some of his writings are difficult to follow if, like me, you're not pretty familiar with the personalities of 18th century France, but um, in a few of the, 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 the excerpts that I suggested, I think his sense of humor comes across really pretty well. Um, and he had a very, very um, fearless and sort of biting approach to the issues that he addressed. Um, I think in a little while we'll, we'll come around to talking about how the two of them had a falling out. And I've got a particularly juicy, nasty, scurrilous, hilarious line that Voltaire offered up to Rousseau in response to receiving a, a complimentary copy of the social contract. Um, but for purposes, I think, of having an event, a historical event, to hang a lot of this material on. I want to propose that we think about the 1st of November, 1755, by which time both Voltaire and Rousseau were middle-aged. And um, does anybody have any ideas, just out of curiosity, what, what transpired on the 1st of November, 1755? except for David Harris, because I know he knows. Sam? Uh, the Lisbon earthquake. The Lisbon earthquake, very good. That's mm -hmm. right. Now, the Lisbon earthquake is an event that has cultural significance, um, quite frankly, way beyond the, the, the humanitarian dimensions of it, which is not to take it um, lightly. The estimated death toll, as far as I'm aware, is between 30,000 and 50,000 people dying. Um, the city was devastated, and uh, as a result of the earthquake, there were also um, not, not only massive buildings destroyed, but there was also a series of, of um, catastrophic storms in the port. So it was a very um, significant cultural event and, and one of great destruction that prompted the great figures of the day to try and, um, well, to try their hand at something which I imagine you might have encountered already, um, theodicy. Is that a theme that's come up in the um, lecture so far, the presentation so far? Uh, not the word. Not the word. Okay. Um, well, I want to explain the word maybe. Yes. Okay. Well, theodicy is um, a term taken actually from as far back probably as Homer, as a Greek word, and it basically amounts to a justification for uh, belief in God, not of the sort that you might associate with the apologists of the second century, not a, a kind of reasoned account of the existence of God from a natural theological perspective or from first principles, but instead an attempt to reconcile the belief in the goodness and omnipotence uh, and omniscience of God with 
suffering in the world. So in that sense, it's a justification of um, God in the face of disaster. And the Lisbon earthquake um, prompted responses from people of the stature of Alexander Pope and um, Leibniz attempting to explain how a, a natural disaster of that magnitude was consistent with believing in a benevolent, all-powerful God. Okay? Voltaire was disgusted by this attempt to, to reconcile the two. As I mentioned to you, Voltaire's own um, perspective is broadly deist. And by that, what I mean is Voltaire considered that a first cause could be posited, and that first cause is God. But um, to my knowledge, Voltaire didn't have any great interest in um, attempts to ascribe personality of any sort to God. God simply sets the process in motion, and that's that. So that when a natural disaster occurs of the sort that leveled Lisbon in the mid 18th century, this is understood as the outworkings of natural processes. And what you don't have to do is you don't have to go back behind that event and reconcile it with the existence of um, an anthropomorphic deity who cares about the well-being of the people who've been buried under the collapsed buildings, okay? Um, Rousseau, perhaps out of contrariness, decided to take exactly the opposite perspective and insisted that the, the question about the goodness of God in that context is fundamentally wrong-headed. That it, 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 we, we don't apply the um, concept of goodness as we understand it to God with satisfactory results. And the two of them um, had a flaming argument over this interpretation of the Lisbon earthquake that carried on um, basically for the next 30 years of their lives. Um, so what I want to propose to you is that their response, both of them uh, to the Lisbon earthquake is basically against a background of not taking old certainties for granted any longer. It's no longer the case that, as, um, well, to paraphrase Leibniz anyway, um, this is the best of all possible worlds. A thing which Voltaire ridiculed savagely in Candide under the uh, character of Dr. Pangloss. Um, Voltaire had no patience whatsoever with that view. And um, Rousseau, out of um, a sort of contrary spirit, was, was um, adamant that life basically is good. Now, I think it's worth just pulling apart those two concepts for a moment because they're not strictly in opposition, even though Rousseau and Voltaire did um, have occasionally sort of written arguments with each other. Rousseau's perspective is, in some senses, his reaction to reading Thomas Hobbes. Now, Thomas Hobbes, in his thinking, was mightily influenced by the English Civil War, of course. And if there's a line that anyone knows from Leviathan, it is that life is ugly, brutish, and short. 
So for Hobbes coming out of the experience of the English Civil War, um, the natural condition of humans is a battle of each against all. What Rousseau maintains in response to that view is that people are essentially good. His um, approach to humans and to life in general is really quite optimistic. He doesn't believe that society exists to fetter our destructive impulses to keep us from stealing from one another, to regulate commerce, because without it we would be violent and um, we would basically mistreat one another instinctively. Voltaire's concerns are not particularly engaged with that perspective that comes out of Hobbes. He is simply more interested in addressing what he takes to be the problems of an absolutist monarchy in France. In fact, he was quite taken with what he observed by way of constitutional monarchy in um, England especially, and he is an outspoken advocate of religious tolerance and freedom of thought. Um, to my way of thinking, this corresponds with Voltaire's deism in the sense that Voltaire um, is content to have wide parameters and within those wide parameters people can behave as seems good to them but it doesn't like a thoroughly mechanistic anything it doesn't want to accept as you see for example um in the piece that i propose to read about necessity he doesn't believe in determinism not strict determinism he thinks that Locke provides some support for this view. Uh, to the contrary, he wants people to be able to make decisions about the lives that they will lead and to be at liberty to do so, which uh, requires quite a sort of stable order and an order in terms of which people can have a reasonable expectation of um, non-interference, really. But these are not exactly polar opposites. They're, they're both, they're, they're each of them concerned with different issues. But um, Voltaire, Voltaire considered that Rousseau was foolish in his optimism. He just thought there was no, no grounds for that at all. Um, which is not to say he was pessimistic, in the way that Hobbes is pessimistic. Um, he just thought that the idea of a natural inclination to cooperate was not borne out by experience. Um, yeah, I think th those are the major sort of areas um, in, 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 in their own um, writings and lives that stand out where they made contributions um, and the force of those contributions I, th I think we'll come on to this in a, in a bit is that they were massively influential in the um, in, in, in inspiring the revolutions of the late 18th century the French Revolution and, and the American Revolution in particular the ideas that they promoted were given political form in the um, emerging Republic of France and the United States of America as political experiments in uh, that particular key, the key of deism, 
a key of constitutionalism, um, a key of tolerance and freedom of, of thought and freedom of expression. These ideas um, are common currency now. And um, we owe a great deal of the implementation of their ideas to the um, responses one way or another to the American Revolution and the French Revolution. Dr. Cassidy. Uh, okay. How, you know, we, 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 we often, I think, kind of just take for granted this moment of deism. Um, how did it emerge? All of a sudden, I mean, we've just been, you know, you know that we've been flowing through Western civilization. We've been through recently Bacon and Descartes. And all of a sudden emerges this, this rejection of theism towards this idea of deism and a, a kind of loss of the idea of personhood at the center of whatever being how you want me, where did it come from and is it kind of critical to the 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 voltaire rousseau project that god has been kind of depersonalized i think that i think that it is i think that it is a necessary element to the system um, because what they are both reacting against in practical terms is um, external an ex any external locus of authority and it seems to me that the concomitant notion is that humans are their own source of authority and against that background um, there's a certainly a palpable rejection of any organization like the Catholic Church as Voltaire would see it that would presume to speak on behalf of God I think that that's where the payoff is I think that the lack of um, or, 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 let me not say lack, let me put it in a slightly different way. I think that the break with classical theism is in order to allow a kind of space, if you will, for the personality of the human individual to flourish as against a social order where power was vested in a monarch and power was vested in a church. I mean, it's, it's a, perhaps significant in this context that, um, as I say, Rousseau is a, a Genevan citizen, as he liked to remind everybody, um, which is, of course, it's, it's a, a Calvinist city. Um, it's a city which is predicated on a different kind of religious polity than would have been found in, in France at the time. Um, all of this is as much as to say, to the best of my knowledge, I think that the move toward deism is consequent upon a political order rather than being a deliberate um, primary decision. I think it's a response and a reaction. I think it, it keeps the cosmological explanatory power that would be familiar from the five proofs of God without investing the deity with the kinds of attributes that um, in Voltaire's view, would lend themselves to abuse by, well, Jesuits, for example. So I don't think it's so much um, an intellectual first principle. I, I think it's um, I think it's a corollary of the, the political 
atmosphere and the attempts to understand what it means to be a human. Like, and, but then that itself is already a significant departure from earlier attempts to understand what it means to be human, which is, broadly speaking, in this tradition, constantly referenced toward God. So I think it's a question really of a displacement and a decentering, which then um, develops a pace. So we, 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 you talked about how um, Rousseau and Voltaire famously fell out. Yes. Uh, and uh, as you and I talked earlier today, um, Bertrand Russell's great comment that uh, the surprise wasn't that uh, Voltaire and Rousseau fell out. It, the surprise is that they were ever friends at all. Yes. Well, what, 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 what um, even given what divides them, they are in a way the fathers of what we might think of as modern liberalism. Yes. So what, what do they have in common that, that emerges from their shared vision? Well, um, this is, I, I think, a tremendous emphasis on a, a polity in which humans can thrive as individuals. And that's not reliant upon a, a mythical foundation. It's not reliant on a historical foundation. Instead, it is understood as an order that naturally occurs because humans are a certain kind of social animal. Um, this is quite clear in, in Rousseau, um, it's especially in um, Social Contract, where he, he doesn't attempt to predicate social stability on a divine right enjoyed by anyone. Instead, um, sovereignty is a collective um, abstraction that exists and that humans orientate themselves toward in order to realize a degree of freedom that would not otherwise be available to them. Now, um, I, I'm not as acquainted with the um, political philosophy of Voltaire beyond the obvious um, sort of laissez-faire attitude toward freedom of religion, freedom of expression, if Voltaire articulated a theory of the origins of the polity, I have to admit I'm not aware of it. Um, but because they both agree on the importance of a society in which the individual has significant freedoms to ask questions, to develop um, theories, to make observations, to undertake commercial activity, to attend the, the theater. They both um, promote the um, common value that society exists for the benefit of the uh, citizens who, who constitute the society. And that I think is starkly different from earlier political theories where, um, th for example, with Hobbes, uh, the fundamental analysis is an analysis of power um, from older theorists um, who would maintain that um, all power ultimately, all, all political order ultimately derives from God um, and is exercised whether in the secular sphere or in the ecclesiastical sphere um, as an extension and representation of God's power. I think, um, I think that I think the secularism is an important commonality between both of them. Even though they were both aware that religion has an important social value, 
um, their projects were fundamentally secular projects, it seems to me. Do you think I'm, do you think I'm reading into it if I say that there is, there is a change in the understanding of freedom as an idea? That, that the classical idea of freedom was, was to be able to conform oneself to the good. Mm. But with, with Voltaire and Rousseau, is there emerging this idea of, of freedom being located in the will? That the, that the individual must be able to exert one's will into the world? Well, that's a good point. Um, you know, th th that, would, uh, that contrast certainly makes sense. Um, as against, say, a background of essentially a kind of neoplatonic um, theory of goodness, where freedom is exercised by conformity to the good, by approximation to the good. Um, yes, freedom is, is exemplified instead for Voltaire, for Rousseau, by an ability to um, affect one's choices. And it's not so much that that's an opposite, it's just that that's a completely different question, you know? In much the same way I suggested earlier that, that Voltaire and Rousseau are sort of um, diametrically opposed to each other because Voltaire is, you know, may, may think that it's fair to mock Rousseau for being optimistic, but he's not a pessimist. Um, in that same sort of sense, this notion of freedom is just asking a completely different question to what freedom would have been understood to mean by, as far as I'm aware, any Stoic, Platonist, Peripatetic, um, basically anyone who believed in free will in the run-up to this period would have considered the exercise of free will in terms of the moral contours of the universe and living in a way that accords with those moral features of reality. I'm not aware of anything like that. Certainly, I, I certainly haven't encountered it in the social contract. Um, and I, I can't, I genuinely can't imagine Voltaire having anything but scorn for that perspective. Thank you. Um, so we've touched on now, like some uh, obviously quite important ideas coming through, like um, uh, there's, there seems this elevation of the individual, the elevation of man in, in the political sphere and uh, the consequent sort of uh, lowering of of the importance of God within that, in terms of sovereignty, um, okay. and so to move maybe to sort of focus in on on one of the texts um, in Rousseau's uh, social contract, he discusses this idea called the Republic. Yes, which we we've come across something called the Republic in Plato before, but I'm guessing, well, well, I've read it, so uh, there's there's some differences. Uh, and one of the key differences is the role of uh, things like democracy yes. um, and the importance of the software and also where sovereignty is being held. Um, wondering if you could sort of uh, unwrap that, uh, the, the, the system that he's putting forward in terms of this role of democracy, the role of the, the aristocracy and the monarchy, but also maybe a bit about where maybe God fits into that picture. Okay. Um, well, first of all, oh, I'm sorry, I've, I've got two, bear, bear with me for just a moment here, I've got two computer monitors going and I just, I just um, opened up something that blocked the image on the camera, sorry about that. Um, the fundamental principle for Rousseau is that People have a collective will, which is closely related to, um, uh, to our sovereignty. It's not something that's divisible. It's not something that can be abrogated. 
um, it is it is an expression of the general will. An expression of the general will brings the state into existence. Historically, and, and I, I do think this is actually a point that is easily overlooked. Um, when Rousseau talks about the social contract, when he talks about the origins of the state, he's not proposing this as a historical account. It's, this is an analysis. Um, it's a, it's a, it, it is, a, it is a, a piece of political theory, not a piece of political history. Right? So he's perfectly well aware that governance is possible in lots of different modes. A uh, section that I circulated, I should say that loosely circulated, um, from book three, sections four to eight, it's perfectly well aware that you have different political structures. Right? Um, so he's not attempting to account for, he's not attempting to account for the origins of the state or law. Instead, what he's talking about is how a state is legitimated. I mean, sovereignty is that in virtue of which the actions of a government is legitimate or illegitimate. It is legitimate if it furthers the general will and promotes the well-being of its members. Now, that can happen under different specific configurations, each of which has an inbuilt tendency to go wrong in, in broadly predictable ways. So for example, if you have an aristocracy and it becomes hereditary, um, it will ultimately tend to be self-serving. It will tend to, to exist for its own benefit, the, 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 the aristocratic government. Um, and as that process develops, that kind of government loses the legitimacy that it would otherwise have by virtue of its promotion of sovereignty and, and the, the general will. And if that happens, it is legitimate to overthrow the government. The government exists to promote a, a kind of common interest in a good life. And if the government of the day is incapable of so doing, then with reference to sovereignty, it is possible to overthrow that form of government and implement a new form of government that will be legitimate, not because it has a historical pedigree or because it has been um, duly consecrated by religious authority, but rather because it gives practical expression to the general will. It, it's, it is justified by reference to sovereignty, which exists independently uh, from the state and also from us. Um, if you were looking for a theoretical construct in Rousseau that assimilates to God, this is a pretty good substitute. It, it exists, it exists um, without reference to the particular forms in which it's instantiated. It is objective. It is transpersonal, and we recognize a good political order with reference to it. Now, 
I'm, I'm not suggesting that he simply substituted this political will for God. I'm just I'm simply observing that it has certain features, that a certain a certain shape that might be familiar to you otherwise from um, earlier sort of high medieval thinking about God. Um, I feel like I may have strayed from your question, Daniel. Uh, maybe you should rein me back in. Am, am, I, am I close at all to what you were asking about? Uh, no, no, I, I thought you were doing great. <laughs> okay, I wasn't just going for a compliment, but I'll take it. Um, no, it's, I, so I think that the, the, the point with Rousseau, I think the point with Rousseau is that we are fundamentally social. Um, we, we have a natural tendency to want to lead a good life. And instead of being obliged and constrained to um, not mistreat each other, what we do spontaneously is we pool our collective will and we give practical structure to our desire to lead a good life through laws and through a social order that can uphold those laws. Um, so at the at the uh, in the final section that you sent around you it, it, it he discusses um, uh, civil religion oh yes uh, maybe this would be a, a good way of um, highlighting one right. of this major shift um, because uh, correct me if I'm wrong uh, but he argues that he seems to argue that the place of religion is subordinate to the state but in a sense that it's it's almost indistinguishable in that um and he seems he sees the part of the problem with a problem with christianity is that it it points to another realm that divides up uh, the polity from uh it creates two polities or two um two vying or competing um wants for power within within the polity or within the community or whatever you call it yes no i think that's i think that's right um it, it's a sort of whistle stop tour of, of of the actual history as he sees it of political theory which is not what we get at the beginning when he talks about um the origin of law you know he begins with a, a civic religion sorry no that's right actually that is the term i want to use a civic religion of the mold of classical antiquity where there is not so much um, two distinct orders as there's a single order which is both political and religious which is epitomized by the role of the um, college of priests and by the role of the Pontifex Maximus, where the cult ultimately converges on the, the, the divine counterpart of the emperor by the second century in Christian era in the Roman world. Um, and he takes those characteristics and sort of walks forward with them. Um, and he does see the consequences for the Roman classical order after the advent of Christianity as not, not being unambiguous. I mean, there, 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 are, there are problems um, with the displacement of the old Roman pagan cult by um, Christian emperors. Um, just, there's, there was a passage in here that I was, I was thinking of, let's see. Yes. 
Um, so this is, this is from that section, book four, section eight, on civil religion. And um, I'm looking at page 227. Um, let us return to the subject of right and determine principles on this important point. The right which the social pact gives to the sovereign over its subjects does not, as I've said, pass the limits of public utility. Subjects then, on no account of their opinions to the sovereign, except so far as those opinions are of moment to the community. Now it's very important for the state that every citizen should have a religion which may make him delight in his duties, but members, um, sorry, but uh, the dogmas of this religion concern neither the state nor its members, except so far as they affect morality and the duties which he who professes it is bound to perform towards others. Each may have in addition such opinions as he pleases without its being the business of the sovereign to know them. For as he has no jurisdiction in the other world, the destiny of his subjects in the life to come, whatever it may be, is not his affair, provided that they are good citizens in this life. So um, there is an effective separation between matters of religion, which are essentially private, matters of, uh, um, except insofar as there is a public um, morality, which is in the interests of society at large. So um, this, I think, is, is the origin of laicite, um, which is, is characteristic feature of, of French society that, I mean, this is, this is, as an American, it strikes me as being quite distinct from the, the, the American notion of the separation of church and state. They're superficially similar, but, um, but what it means in real terms in America is quite different to what Rousseau is describing here. In, in real terms in America, what it means is nobody can force you to belong to a particular church. But um, as I, I dare say, you're probably aware, most of you have noticed, um, you can pretty much behave any way you like in America as long as you have some kind of religious coloration to it. And it can be desperately antisocial. I mean, wildly, wildly antisocial. This idea from Rousseau is on a different order. It's driving at something completely different, which is to say um, that's not the concern of the state. The concern of the state is not to make you a better person. It's to, it's to recognize your freedom and to create social um, structures within which you can, um, you can pursue a life that satisfies you. So, so there seem to be two things there. One is, one is the, um, uh, the aspect of just simply you are free mm -hmm. to act as you will. And therefore, I guess you can engage in religion if you choose to do that. But there also seemed to be an aspect, uh, a sense to which you were saying that in this, what we might call uh, liberal perspective or Republican perspective of Rousseau, uh, a sense to which religion is important to society, but only so far as it's useful. In the sense that it instills uh, morals and values that are useful to to the to the polity or the society. But that is 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 that all he's saying? Is would he still think that there's something more to it than that, or would he? Is it just is that right? And is it and is it just a matter of it being useful? I mean, he does he does have more to say to it than that. Um, because he is reflective of um, of Calvin's Geneva, basically. So it, it's not a free for all um, in the sense, I, I've, I've overstated the case basically of connecting this to kind of contemporary um, French laicite. 
in, in fact, um, right toward the end, he says, basically, um, where is it? But whosoever dares to say outside the church, no salvation ought to be driven from the state, unless the state be the church and the prince be the pontiff. Such dogma is proper only in a theocratic government. Um, I take it that the point of that is that the state doesn't have a responsibility to make its citizens good. That responsibility rests with the citizens themselves. Um, and there needs to be tolerance for one another without which we, each of us, lose our freedom. Um, I have to admit, I, I don't know nearly enough about the writings of Calvin to be able to trace out the influence. I, in fact, I, I came to Rousseau in the course of studying jurisprudence rather than in any other particular way. Um, so I probably should, should um, I should probably spare you um, just completely wild free form speculation on my part about this. But, but I, I think that the, the basic answer is there's still a presumption of the goodness of people that religion is socially cohesive and it is desirable, but the standards for conformity are relatively low. Um, and I think this is aligned to Rousseau's optimism. Uh, one of the, the, the lines that's often said about Rousseau is um, it was put to him that it was put to him, men are evil. And Rousseau's response is, men are evil, but man is good. And I mean, this is the sort of article of faith, if you like, that is expected. And it's not required that a person should have um, complete conformity to articles of faith. Before handing on thing, things on to Lucy, uh, Lars, who's making hot dogs for his sons in Vancouver, has uh, texted me a question. That's nice. It seems to me a really profound shift that's going on with the idea of governance, of our common life together being separated from what we might think of as personhood, right? Located in the monarch, in the aristocrat, in the vicar, and was there, was there any concern on the part of Voltaire and Rousseau that this kind of abstraction of our common life into something that doesn't actually exist, right? The state, uh, which later, you know, 150 years, 200 years later, you know, Kafka will come up against with this, this you know, the, the kind of arbitrariness of, of the state. Was there any worry in their mind that this idea of, of our common life together being largely based on an, uh, on a, on an abstraction, right? It doesn't exist. It's not, a, it, it does, it's not rooted in a person or it's just rooted in, our, in our, this myth of our common will. Was there any worry on their part that it, that might cause problems? Well, yes. I mean, I think for Rousseau there clearly is because, um, he specifically advocates the possibility of overthrowing a political order that has become tyrannous. And um, he doesn't have, 
a prescriptive formula for, for when that can or should happen, but um, it, it seems to me that far from being an abstraction, what Rousseau has um, argued is that when our sovereignty, which as he maintains is inalienable, is challenged, abridged, um, disregarded, trampled, then we are justified in reasserting it and in reshaping the political order in a form that will again allow tolerance to flourish. Um, this is a predecessor, I suppose, of um, the pauper's paradox of tolerance, which is to say that the one thing that a, 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 a liberal in the mode of Rousseau can't tolerate is for other people to be intolerant. Um, intolerance as a basic platform whether it's in matters religious or political undermines the broad freedom enjoyed by members of the society and it therefore has to be challenged um now at least from my recollection of of um kafka the, the kind of kafka-esque state exists for its own sake and regularly crushes people who are basically unwittingly victims to its arbitrariness. And um, I think in response to that, what Rousseau is able to say is that is intolerable because it does not allow for the exercise of human sovereignty. Now, if on the other hand, instead of being Kafka-esque, sort of dystopian, it, it's a, a um, it's a Soviet communist totalitarianism of the sort described by Solzhenitsyn, you similarly say in response to that, this is a political order which um, attempts to infringe upon the sovereignty of the citizens, and it is therefore necessary to overthrow it. And I suppose, to my way of thinking, that comes really very close to the idea of human dignity, which is an abstraction on one view, but at the same time, I don't think it's an abstraction that's incapable of motivating people to its defense. Um, in much the same way that, 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 that human rights can elicit a response, um, even though it is an abstraction. It's, it's not personalized in the way that earlier uh, political orders would be personalized, but it's, it's still capable, it seems to me, of inspiring acts of courage and bravery, of calling people to um, make sacrifices and stand up for what they believe in. So it is quite different, but I don't think that means it's somehow ineffectual. And certainly, I think for, for Voltaire, the um the idea of being told what to do um under threat of arbitrary punishment is is just it's it's no way for a human to live so it is shifted there is a depersonalization but i mean it seems to me possibly a mark of the success of exactly what Voltaire and Rousseau have, a try, had tried, have tried to achieve, that 
Um, well, can I mention Brexit? What was that about? That wasn't about that. That was that was exactly discussed in terms of sovereignty, regaining sovereignty. Um, now I'm not going to. I'm not going to presume to comment on it, but it, <laughs> it is the most consequential, one of the most consequential political decisions, um, I dare say, of, of my lifetime. And it's entirely motivated by regard for the kinds of abstractions that, that were dear to the hearts of both Voltaire and Rousseau. So yes, yes, I mean, it is different. Yes, it has been depersonalized. But that hasn't that hasn't me that hasn't meant that it doesn't work. It still works, e even though there's an abstraction to it. I mean, I, you know, I I think it's um, I think it's capable of being understood as a different way of symbolizing what we believe in uh, in terms of the political order. Not necessarily. I mean, you know, I mean, for 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 me growing up in the states, it was about a flag. It still is. I mean, I'm sure you're aware that Americans get really weird when people start burning flags, American flags. Well, that's because that's that's that is an object that has been heavily invested with a sense of national identity, far more so than a head of state that we can turf out after eight years at the outside. And that's depersonalized, but it still has the same um, power to motivate people, call out action, I think. Okay, I'm going to keep this last question brief because I want to give um, our audience and our other participants a good chance to ask questions of their own. So, We've looked at, um, in, in quite some depth, how Voltaire and Rousseau's ideas will influence uh, the age of revolution. In the weeks to come, we'll be moving towards and into modernity. So in a sentence or two, could you perhaps tell us how much of what we're now going to see owes its existence to these new ideas which we've explored this evening? Mm. I, I think that they're massively influential. Um, I think that what, what the combined effect of Voltaire and Rousseau accomplished was they took um, from the English the notion of a political order that is rooted in history but governed by laws and they turned that into the catalyst for two types of revolution that were markedly distinct if you think as I think basically that Edmund Burke was right about the difference between the American Revolution and the, the French Revolution. Um, I, think the, 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 I think their influence is felt in the um, acceptability of a public order that is multicultural, where a difference in belief is um, not simply tolerated, um, but, but is enshrined in law. Um, I mean, amongst our human rights, we do have um, rights to disagree with each other within broad, um, within very, very broad uh, terms, so long as it's not destructive of the order. Um, you know, have, have a look at the European Convention on Human Rights. And, and it's precisely that kind of, well, the paradox of tolerance is embedded in it. Uh, if you think, for example, about the, the lockdown that affects those of us here 
in the UK, um, we've had our civil rights pretty seriously infringed because the political order has exercised its power to um, issue regulations and restrictions that are not ordinarily tolerable because it's for the public good. That kind of explanation is just worlds apart from saying, well, because I said so. You know, the, 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 because, because of Rousseau, because of Voltaire, it's possible to think in terms of something like the, the, the European Convention on Human Rights or the Human Rights Act. And there's one thing, one thing that I want to add. This, is, this goes beyond your sentence here, but I mentioned this and I would, I would berate myself later if I didn't give this to you. Rousseau sent a copy of On the Social Contract to Voltaire. And this is what Voltaire had to say. I have received your new book against the human race and thank you for it. Never was such a cleverness used in the design of making us all stupid. One longs in reading your book to walk on all fours. But as I have lost that habit for more than 60 years, I feel unhappily the impossibility of resuming. it. Nor can I embark in the search of the savages of Canada because the maladies to which I am condemned render a European surgeon necessary to me because war is going on in those regions and because the example of our actions has made the savages nearly as bad as ourselves. That's Voltaire and it's still funny. Anyway, I couldn't resist that. I love it. Rousseau is good for thinking with Voltaire is really funny, really, really, really funny. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video and found it somehow informative, please be sure to click like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We would also love it if you visited the center on the web at www.appliedtheology.org.uk and took out a membership. At £20 per year, your membership is one of the main means of support on which we depend to carry out our work. Finally, look for us on social media. We can be found on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Just do a search for the Center for Applied Theology. We look forward to having you join us.